How would you define the current status of the use of technology in America specifically? Ooh, the, the, the current status. Um, you know, I, I think technology is a really big word. Actually, I think Greg mentioned this earlier, what is tech versus what is technology? Um, so I'm going to just narrow it a little bit to social media, not because I think social media is the end all be all only thing that has ever gone wrong in the world. But it's I mean, I always have to say that because it's crazy how quickly people will lump you into a bucket that you never actually said you were in. <laughs> but it is what I have worked on the most both intimately and um, both within Facebook and before I went there. And I do think it is the biggest catalyst for some of the issues that we see right now. You said in the US in particular. So I do think that's an, it is interesting. I spent my whole career focused overseas and then I did a dramatic turn to focusing in the US around 2015 specifically because I had spent my whole career on counter extremism issues. Right. Yeah. And then and you can also like, it would be great if you can maybe pose like a contrast, how you see it abroad, given your experience, sure. that would be also. Great. Yeah. Um, but it was very clear in 2015 for some people earlier, I was no, in no way the first person to see this, <laughs> that there was something happening in the U S that while there had always been anger, there's always been hatred, there's always been polarization, all these things have always existed. But something was accelerating it in a way that really did feel new to the point where it wasn't just that we had more and more divisions being exposed, but it was the fact that those people who really were sort of here in terms of how they felt about any given issues were being further and further pulled to the extremes. And so I, I've been digging in for years, including a short stint at Facebook. I, I laugh because anyone who knows me knows that I left pretty abruptly and have been very public about why. But the bottom line is this. Do I blame social media for the problems that we as a society have yet to truly grapple with or yet to truly address? Absolutely not. But that does not absolve particular companies of intentional design and business decisions that they have made to intentionally ensure that I'm not going to give the attention economy speech right now, but it is important to really remember this. Many people would have you shift the discussion to talk about content moderation. Why? Because content moderation is an unsolvable problem in the United States. You know it is solvable. A business model that intentionally ends up surfacing the most extreme voices and often silencing those people who actually want to have truly engaged, nuanced conversations. And that's what I care about. I care about the intentional decisions, not about should this piece of content come down, should that piece of content be up? And I don't think we've gotten anywhere on that yet in the US. And it's really frustrating because I think many of us don't realize that Facebook in particular wants us to talk about content moderation. They do not want us to talk about their business model. And so they make sure that we continue to talk about content moderation. This is her opinion, okay? <laughs> that is my opinion. Um, and I was wondering, you were, you were talking about, of course, content moderation. What are the challenges that you see besides Facebook? Like, in other tech companies, and let's expand this to other countries. How do you see these challenges being overcome through the years? Yeah, so I want to be clear on one of the reasons why I use Facebook often, most often. Well, A, because I worked there, so I actually have intimate knowledge. But also B, because I do still find that to this day, they are the most egregious. I, I do find that... So it's interesting. We like to talk about how 
they're starting to lose the relevance in the US and maybe we should be thinking more about TikTok or maybe we should be thinking more about Discord or any, any name your platform. Yes, I think we should be thinking about all of them. But let's not forget that Facebook recklessly, relentlessly and intentionally scaled to dominate the entire world's information ecosystem minus maybe China minus maybe Russia now. It was an intentional decision. They went into countries that did not have a robust media landscape to begin with. They offered their, they struck deals with national governments and telecoms to become the app on people's phone that became the gateway to the internet. I bring this up for a reason. We are like trying to move on in the US and say, oh, we should talk about, they're not that powerful anymore. Yes, they are. They are, you go to the Philippines, you go to India. I went to India on a Facebook research trip when I worked there. Every single person we spoke to, when we said, how do you get onto the internet? They said through Facebook. So I just wanna be really clear that we have a very US centric lens often when we're talking about this. And rightfully so, these companies were birthed here and these companies scaled to the degree that they scaled and exported their ideology to the rest of the world because of our legal permissive environment here. And it is on us to fix this. It really bothers me that we're counting on Europe and Australia and Canada to fix something that we helped create. That said, I will help Europe and Australia and Canada <laughs> since, since I actually have more hope that they will get there before we will, but shame on us. I just want to be very clear about that. But we have very much exported Mark Zuckerberg's ideology to the entire world, and he did it intentionally and has never invested in also building up the protective measures for the rest of the world. And so it is it's when people say, why do you still talk about Facebook? I mean, there's so no, nobody under 70, I'm under 70, but whatever, nobody under 70 uses Facebook. Really? Have you stepped outside of the United States? And Instagram is Facebook too. And What's WhatsApp up? is Facebook too. <laughs> so anyway, that was, that was very lengthy, but my point is just this. If you intentionally, if your goal is to dominate the entire world's public square, if that's what you want to call it, why on earth do you think you don't have the responsibility to be a good steward of that? And that is what I always talk about, the responsibility side of it, not the, did they make the right decision on this particular piece of content on any given day? Because as we heard the last panel say, those decisions, like I actually do give space for mistakes. Mistakes happen. It's how you choose as a leader to deal with that mistake that tells me what I need to know. I want to um, take you back to your counterterrorism experience. Um, what comes to your mind when you hear news like the ones that we received uh, from Buffalo last Saturday? So... What happened in Buffalo was a product of so many different things. And what's interesting in the conversation I'm hearing now, there's already people immediately saying, well, it's not Facebook's fault that this guy was a racist. Or it's, it, it, it's not about whose fault it is. It's about every single piece of the puzzle that contributed to what happened. Here's the biggest problem. We have systemic issues in the United States of America that we have never come to terms with. And that is not Facebook's fault. That is not Discord's fault. That is not Twitter's fault. However, when I was in the, so in my counter extremism days, I spent a few years in particular leading what some might call our hearts and minds work along the Somalia border. If you've heard my story before, you've already heard this, but I'm gonna repeat it now. And the number one thing I learned during those few years, and this was pre-Facebook, this was like 2004 to 2006, is I was spending time in vulnerable communities that were specifically susceptible to extremist messaging. And all I was doing was trying to build trust. And most of that came from me listening, not speaking, not arguing, just listening 
understanding and building actual trust. That sounds so old school, I get it. But the other thing I learned is what made people vulnerable to extremist messaging. And there were lots of certain traits that it wasn't whether you're rich or poor, it was, it was usually you feel disaffected, powerless, marginalized. You don't believe your government is there to actually help protect you or take care of you. And this outsider has come in and started exploiting your vulnerabilities to make you feel like you belong, like you're part of something, and then start to radicalize you. And that was the core to my many years in the encounter extremism world. So what do we see online now? What did we see with the guy from Buffalo? What did we see with, with the woman who was shot and killed when she entered the Capitol on January 6th? Like I did a deep dive into her Twitter feed. We saw a US veteran who came back after a few tours overseas, who was disaffected, who was marginalized, who was having a hard time coping with how to readjust to civilian life. And then you watch her social media feed. She starts going, she starts getting fed more and more and more extreme content. And here is why I bring all of this up. And, and I'll wrap up. I know I'm, I'm going on for a very long time here. But in the days when pre-social media, radicalizing an individual was just like, it was a process. It was a very, you had to understand their vulnerabilities and then you had to feed into that and make them trust you and then go down this path of radicalization. Today, we have recommendation engines that have figured out what makes you tick. And I mean, just don't take it from me. Read the research that came out of these so-called Facebook papers. Read the article on Carol's journey to QAnon. It proves exactly what I've been saying for years that it, look it up. It was an individual, a fake account that a Facebook researcher made who went online. She liked like three things. She was a fake Midwestern woman in her forties, a mom. She followed one or two politicians and one or two news outlets. Within two days, she was being recommended conspiracy theories. And within, I think four days, she was being actually recommended into QAnon groups. Why does that matter? because Facebook will have you believe they're a mirror to society and that they're just showing you what you are looking for. And I would say, as long as we have never had actual transparency into how the recommendation systems worked, we will never know if, that, if any of these people actually went looking for QAnon or went looking for these hate groups or whether they were pushed into them. And that's why too, I I think it was probably Renee's panel when they talked about transparency for transparency's sake, 100% want to double click on that. The reason we need transparency of some sort into how these systems work is so that then we can build the accountability mechanism if in fact they did actually push someone into these radicalized groups. So the guy from Buffalo, I mean, his manifesto is one thing, but now they're starting to release some of his Discord chats from, from while he was there. He had a toothache. Apparently, that was his number one grievance. His Jewish doctor didn't fix it. So then he started blaming Jews for it. And then, like, all the things, and, and, and you can say that's not social media's fault. I agree. That's many problems. Yeah. And also double clicking on the accountability issues as well, like due to the lack of designations of these groups, I would say, um, and also the, exist the existing narrow focus of um, hate crime legislations as well, under which these perpetrators are often tried. Um, it is quite challenging, I, I guess, for, for states in general to be able to prosecute these people um, effectively who are so clearly driven by xenophobia, racism, um, and other forms of intolerance. Um, and I would like to um, take a step back, and I'm curious if we can zoom in on what you mentioned about the evolution of how people um, were radicalized prior to social media? And maybe what do you think are some of the dangers that have developed over, over the years? This one I'll try to make a little shorter. I know I can be very long-winded. Um, 
You know, when I was in my more counter extremism days, in, in the early to mid 2000s, we would talk about the lone wolf. That was the issue we were dealing with, right? Believe it or not, I joined government before September 11th. So I went through this whole like process and path of different kinds of work in this space. But then we started having what we called the lone wolf. And if it really was like the Fort Hood shooter was, it, this might be before many of your time, but, but this man was apparently radicalized by Anwar al-Awlaki, who was a, a cleric, an American born cleric in Yemen. And what happened here? Yes, the internet was definitely a factor because he started watching Alalaki's sermons, but then they started emailing each other. And so why did we call him a lone wolf? Because a lone wolf is an individual who was radicalized and acts on his own. Here's what's interesting about what's happening now. And we, we, gra we struggled with that in government. We struggled with it in part because we only want to believe that terrorists are foreigners. We don't want to believe that terrorists can be Americans. That is, a, that is a huge other issue in and of itself. But now online, that same like one-to-one -one process of radicalizing someone is not even necessary. I will, you, we can't call these lone wolves anymore. These are people who find their crew online who find their fellow white supremacists and they all start to go down a further and further path of grievance together. You don't need that one terrorist somewhere off in the world to really hands-on recruit you anymore. So lone wolves in and of themselves were very challenging to tackle. And now we have a situation where it's entire groups and let's not sugarcoat it. We like to be politically correct and sugarcoat it of white men with like this sort of victimhood grievance going on. And the internet is really helping them find all the reasons to believe that their grievances are legitimate. And yes, I believe that actually Facebook does not want this on their platform. I will be clear about that. I don't blame them for everything in the world. And I believe they're trying to tackle some of that, but they will not touch their business model. They will not touch the piece of the puzzle that is actually helping identify your vulnerabilities and sucking you into the platform to keep you engaged. And that's what bothers me. <laughs> and there's a few things that bother me. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free to rant. Uh, we were focusing a lot on like big platforms vis-a-vis uh, -vis Facebook. Um, what's, your, what's your take on smaller platforms? Because it's undeniable the migration that happens from big tech platforms to smaller ones that do not have the resources maybe to mm, change their business model or to content, moderate content more effectively. So what is your take on those? Um, I actually think it's often the other way. It starts on the smaller platform and then migrates to the bigger platforms. But this is why I know that people think we can't regulate our way out of this, but that does not make it okay to not have any government imposed guardrails on how, whether it's surveillance capitalism or whether it's surveillance advertising, all the systemic parts of platform design. If we just... Let's be clear. Here's why I have a hard time talking. I know what's coming next. How do we fix this? So I'm jumping ahead, but still on this question. I get asked this all the time, and everyone in this room are the type of people who are trying to figure out how to fix this, right? But the one thing we're never allowed to talk about is unfettered capitalism and how that plays into all of this. And asking me to figure out how to fix this in an environment where no, but it's really important. Normally, there are certain level levers for accountability, right? This is what our free market account economy is about. Five general levers: government. Well, that is absent in this space. The next one is shareholders. Doesn't apply to a company like Facebook because Mark Zuckerberg has his dual class structure. Shareholders can't hold them accountable. The next one is supposed to be the markets. I'm sorry, but. Wall Street has absolutely rallied. They, they, they rallied behind Facebook after a $5 billion FTC fine. That leaves two groups, employees, which hopefully more and more employees are going to stand up and demand more or quit. And I mean, for 
for these companies, I would say advertisers as opposed to consumers. Those are the only two groups, in my opinion, who right now can hold any sort of flame to the fire. As long as Wall Street, venture capitalists, all of the, the money behind it continues to not care, then asking someone like me or anyone in this room, how do we fix it? We can all, I, I'm amazed by so much of what so many people in this community are working on, but it's an uphill battle when the power structures still remain that one Silicon Valley white guy, possibly two if Elon Musk succeeds, continue to hold the power of the entire way the world connects with zero accountability baked in. So, okay, I'm not always a downer. Ask me a positive question. <laughs> that's, I'm, I'm going for that. I'm going for that right now. Exactly. I want to focus on the bright side, if we can. Um, what can you mention? What kind of policies can you mention that in the tech industry that actually worked? Policies, or you mean like self-regulation? Or incentive structures. Let's okay, put so it that incentive way. structures is the perfect way to frame it, yeah. actually, because it is all about incentive structures, right? Um, I I am very happy to see how many sort of the next generation of technologists are asking much deeper, more critical questions. I am really hoping we get to the point where we stop holding up the tech founder as a god who cannot be questioned because his vision is more important than his execution. I am encouraged by, as long as it is not window dressing, it is, becomes real, by companies understanding what it means to have the right people at the table to discuss how you should be developing your product. I, so I'm encouraged by a lot of that. I'm not totally encouraged by the venture community and who they continue to back. I'm hoping that we can make some dents there. Um, I find it a bit unfortunate though. A lot of folks in this community will call me and ask me, hey, can you help us think through, <laughs> again, I'm gonna keep quoting Renee, the unintended consequences or the potential unintended consequences. And like, it's only unintended if you don't feel like discussing it before you make your product. But in their defense, it's always, well, we haven't raised enough to be able to pay you to help us that with that because the people who have invested in us are expecting these returns first. So the move fast thing still exists, move fast and scale and deal with the cleanup later that we really, really need to fix that. Because for all the really amazing things that many of you are trying to build, we have to have the space to build it in a better way without the pressure to scale before we are even sure that what we are trying to build is not going to hurt people. That's that's great. I would like to, I think we are almost on time. So I would like to end on a positive note, um, if it's possible. And given all the colleagues that are joining us here and people watching online, um, I think without a doubt, forums like this um, and building a responsible tech community is a great step forward. Um, and an effective tech policy also needs a whole of society approach. And I was wondering if you can end um, this conversation telling us what else should be done, right? What else can we actually do to create a healthier internet? And you touched upon a little bit which stakeholders you would seat at the table, um, but who else should be involved in how? <laughs> I love how much she keeps trying to get me to be positive and then I keep going. <laughs> Um, yes, I think I, I, I am holding out a lot of hope. I don't mean to say I've given up on my generation. Sorry, folks, but I am holding out hope for this newer crop of technologists who will be more steeped in a more interdisciplinary approach. Cause it's funny, right? I'm not a technologist. I, and yet I saw things years before people started exposing it at Facebook, it was just kind of obvious. And back then my voice was like, who are you to talk about 
what's happening in technology. Today, I think we understand that there are sociologists and anthropologists and risk people and, uh, you know, humanist chaplains, apparently, and all sorts of people who, who have a stake in ensuring that technology serves us all better. And so hopefully we'll continue to use their voices and seek roles within tech companies. That's another thing. People think I'm anti-tech. No, I want tech to do better. And I want to make sure that the people who come from a wide variety of backgrounds help ensure that that happens. Great. Excellent. Perfect way to end it. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>